Hello and welcome to Indus News, live from Islamabad. I am Muneeb Hamid with the news of this hour. Let's begin with the headlines first. The United States deaths from the coronavirus have surpassed 280,000 with 14 and a half million cases. The virus has claimed more than 140,000 lives in India, with the tally of infections crossing 9.6 million. Meanwhile, Pakistan has reported 58 deaths and over 3,300 cases overnight. The nation's death toll has risen to 8,361. The virus has claimed over 1.5 million lives across the world and infected 66 million. In India, the government has failed to break a deadlock with protesting farmers despite several hours of talks. The farmers made it clear to the official they will not end their protests until all new agriculture laws are withdrawn. Earlier, Canada's Prime Minister Justin Trudeau once again defended the farmers' right to hold protests. Pakistan has rejected Indian media reports alleging Islamabad of sending foreign fighters to occupied Kashmir. The Foreign Office said India is trying to cast a shadow on Kashmiri's legitimate struggle for freedom through such fabrications. It told India to let Kashmiris exercise their right to self-determination instead of peddling fake news. Differences between Saudi Arabia and Qatar may end as the two countries hinted at resolving the Gulf crisis. In an interview, Saudi Foreign Minister Prince Faisal bin Farhan said Riyadh and its allies are fully on board and a final agreement is expected soon. Earlier, Qatar's Foreign Minister Sheikh Mohammed bin Abdul Rahman Al Thani said there have been positive developments in this regard. Riyadh and its allies got ties with Qatar in 2017, accusing it of backing terrorism charges, Doha denies. And in football, Chelsea came from one goal behind to beat Leeds United 3-1 at Stamford Bridge in the English Premier League. Patrick Bamford opened the scoring for Leeds before Olivier and Kurt Zuma and Christian Pulisic scored goals for Chelsea. With this win, Chelsea have moved to the top of the table. Headlines news in detail coming up after a short break. Stay with us. Welcome back. Now let's have the news in detail. United States deaths from the coronavirus have surpassed 280,000 with 14 and a half million cases. The virus has claimed more than 140,000 lives in India, with the tally of infections crossing 9.6 million. The virus has claimed over 1.5 million lives across the world and infected 66 million people. Details in this report. The unprecedented surge of COVID-19 across the globe has brought the world's healthcare systems to their knees. Faced with a dire shortage of hospital beds, more states in the U.S. are imposing sweeping lockdowns. Down south in Latin America, deaths and infections are spiking in Brazil as the government refuses to impose any restrictions amid the second wave. While the U.S. and the U.K. are set to start mass dispensation of vaccines this week, Russia has already begun immunizing its health workers. I have not had coronavirus and I want to protect myself and my loved ones with whom I live. That's why I took this decision. I am the only medical worker in the family. So God forbid, to avoid bringing it home, I decided to get vaccinated. The recent wave of restrictive measures across Europe has somewhat contained the spike in deaths. But most nations fear a third wave of the virus after the Christmas season ends. Further east, deaths and infections are on the rise again in Iran as people ignore precautions and take to markets during the winter vacation. 
Every day we see that the national COVID-19 death toll is in the hundreds. This is simply too much. With the size of the population in our country, how can we accept such numbers of deaths? And the reason behind it is because people are not adhering to the rules. Meanwhile, Japan and Australia are now set to ease restrictions on domestic travel after successfully containing the second wave. Meanwhile, in Pakistan, 58 people have died of COVID-19 in the past 24 hours, reaching the death toll to 8,361. The health ministry says more than 3,300 tested positive for the virus overnight. The ministry says there are more than 53,000 active coronavirus cases in the country. It said out of more than 416,000 countrywide cases, over 355,000 people have recovered. Officials said 182,000 cases have been detected in the Sindh province, while Punjab has reported nearly 123,000 cases, while in the capital Islamabad, some 32,000 infections have been recorded. Now, in Armenia, 17 opposition parties have issued an ultimatum to Prime Minister Nikol Pashinyan, demanding him to step down by Tuesday. They have been holding protests in Yerevan after the signing of a trilateral truce over the Nagorno-Karabakh. Opposition politicians say the November 9th statement signed by Pashinyan was an act of submission. Pashinyan's opponents also blame him for the country's economic and social problems. Armenian President Armin Sarkisian has called for an early parliamentary election. He has urged the Prime Minister to hand over the power to a government of national accord before the polls. Now, for the 24th straight week, thousands of Israelis protested against Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu in Jerusalem and called for his resignation. Police say they arrested five demonstrators for so-called violent acts. The protesters say Netanyahu's indictment in major corruption cases and misuse of power disqualify him from holding public office. Israelis also believe that Netanyahu's response to the coronavirus was too slow. Protesters rallied outside the Prime Minister's official residence, blowing whistles, waving signs and flags. They say Netanyahu has imposed dictatorial rule on Israel and acts like a king. The leadership that will uh, make a real democracy, not uh, what's happening right now. That he kills all the democ uh, democratic uh, institutes and uh, he makes what he wants, like a king. And uh, that's what we are against. Well, Israel is once again in a political turmoil and is staring down the barrel of its fourth election in less than 18 months. Now, moving on, voting has closed in Kuwait's parliamentary elections. The Gulf state is currently facing its worst economic crisis in decades, coupled with the devastation from the COVID-19 pandemic. Election observers began counting the votes after polling stations closed. More than 300 candidates, including 29 women, are contesting for the 50-seat Legislative Assembly. After the elections, the Emir of the state will pick the Prime Minister, who will then name the country's cabinet. Kuwait's nearly $140 billion economy is facing a deficit of $46 billion. Now, U.S. President Donald Trump has once again claimed victory in the presidential election, alleging massive fraud. In his first rally appearance since the November 3rd election, Trump campaigned for the two Republican senators in Valdosta and Georgia. Addressing the rally, Trump said he came to persuade Georgians to vote for the Republican Senate candidate in a runoff election on January 5th. The election will determine which party controls the U.S. Senate. Trump repeated unsubstantiated claims of electoral fraud. Just go vote and vote early starting December 14th. You have to do it. They cheated and they rigged our presidential election, but we will still win it. We will still win it. We'll still win it. And they're going to try and rig this election, too. Well, ahead of the rally, Trump pressed Georgia's governor to overturn election results and call a special session of the state legislature. Now, moving to France, where thousands have taken to the streets in Paris against police violence and a controversial security bill. The protesters launched projectiles at riot police, while security forces firing tear gas to disperse the crowd. Paramedics were seen tending to injured protesters at the scenes of the clashes. The demonstrators say the government is trying to cripple civil liberties to document police brutality. 
They charted slogans against the police and the government. The new security bill sets out to increase surveillance tools and restrict rights on circulating images of police officers. Now, French President Emmanuel Macron is set to host Egyptian counterpart Abdel Fattah al-Sisi for a three-day state visit. But ahead of the visit, Paris is facing calls from the activists that Cairo must not be indulged. In a statement, a dozen human rights groups said the French president must stand up for his commitment to promote human rights in Egypt. They said Paris has also allowed French companies to provide Cairo with surveillance and crowd control tools. The rights groups highlighted that there are over 60,000 prisoners of conscience in Egypt. Some NGOs will also hold a protest outside the French parliament on Tuesday, denouncing the partnership between France and Egypt. Now, in other news, Britain and the European Union are resuming talks today in a last-ditch attempt to reach a post-Brexit trade deal. In a joint statement, United Kingdom Prime Minister Boris Johnson and European Union Chief Ursula von der Leyen called for further efforts to resolve serious differences. The long-running talks have experienced severe hindrance over issues of fisheries, level playing fields and governance. The negotiating teams will reconvene in Brussels today, followed by a discussion between the leaders on Monday. Despite significant differences, both sides remain optimistic about securing a trade deal of around $1 trillion per year. Significant differences remain on the three critical issues, level playing field, governance and fisheries. Both sides underline that no agreement is feasible if these issues are not solved. And whilst recognizing the seriousness of these differences, we agreed that a further effort should be undertaken by our negotiating teams to assess whether they can be, these issues can be resolved. We are therefore instructing our chief negotiators to reconvene tomorrow in Brussels and I will speak again to Prime Minister Boris Johnson on Monday evening. Well, if a deal is not reached by December 31st, border checks and taxes will be introduced for goods travelling between the UK and the European Union. Now, the UK Royal Navy has highlighted significant Russian presence close to the country's waters. In a statement, the Royal Navy said it closely monitored nine Russian vessels in the past two weeks. It said these included a surface submarine destroyer Corvette patrol ship and their supporting tugs and supply ships. The statement said eight Royal Navy ships were closely monitoring every movement from waters close to Scotland's west coast. First Sea Lord Admiral Tony Radikin has warned of increased Russian activity in the region. He said Britain is always ready to respond to any threats in home waters and around the globe. Now, Pakistan is observing the 49th martyrdom anniversary of 1971 war hero Major Shabir Sharif Shaheed. He embraced martyrdom after being hit directly by a tank shell on the 6th of December 1971. During the 1971 war, Major Shabir Sharif was commanding the 6th Frontier Force Regiment. He was ordered to capture high ground near Suleimanki headworks, defended by more than a company of the Assam Regiment. Sharif attacked and captured that terrain, killing 43 Indian soldiers and destroying four tanks. He and his men repulsed a counterattack by two enemy battalions. Due to his sacrifice, the government of Pakistan awarded him Nishani Heather, the highest military gallantry award. In a tweet, the military spokesperson, Major General Babar Iftikhar, said Major Shapir Sharif was a symbol of valor and patriotism. Only is coming up in this bulletin after a short break. Stay with us. Welcome back. Now, in the United States, a fire has scorched a historic 19th century middle collegiate church in the lower Manhattan, New York. The blaze started in a five-story vacant building next to the church. 
Built in 1892, I beg your pardon, the church is home to the oldest congregation of the Collegiate Churches of New York. It also houses New York's Liberty Bell. The fire department said four people were injured in the incident. It said the fire was under investigation. In a tweet, New York's mayor termed the incident heartbreaking and pledged to help rebuild the church. Now, a Japanese capsule containing fragments of asteroid Ryugu has landed in Woomera, Australia. The asteroid is about 300 million kilometers away from the Earth. The capsule will be collected by a recovery team and taken to a Japanese lab in Sagamihara City near Tokyo. They are the contents of the capsule will be examined. The Hayabusa 2 blasted off in December 2014 to collect samples of Ryugu in a pioneering mission. Scientists hope the samples will help reveal how life on Earth began. The round-trip mission took six years. And the third Hainan International Film Festival has kicked off in southern China's Sanya City. It is the first movie festival with the red carpet walks this year in China after others were cancelled due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Hundreds of famous directors, actors, actresses and film professionals are attending the event. The festival has received more than 4,000 entries from around 100 countries and regions. A total of 189 movies from dozens of countries will be shown covering eight different categories. Fifteen outstanding overseas films will be selected for online screening. The 8 day event is co-sponsored by China Media Group and the Hainan Provincial Government. Also, China is receiving the country's first snow of the season. Ice-caped mountains have lured people out of their homes for sightseeing. More in this report. As cold air pushed further south, many areas throughout China greeted their first snow of the winter season. It decorated beautiful landscapes with a frosty new look. The famous Mount Fanjing in southwest China's Guizhou province lured tourists who took pictures of the fresh layer of snow covering its steep cliffs and eye-catching peaks. I come from South China's Guangzhou city, where we seldom see snow. It's worth coming to Mount Fancheng as I see the first snow this winter today. This is the first stop of our 10-day self-driving tour. This place is nice, very beautiful. Cold and rainy weather brought snow to East China's Jiangxi province, as Lushan Mountain, a UNESCO World Heritage Site, was also coated in thick frost. Thick frost also appeared at the nearby snow-covered Taiping Mountain in Wuning County. It attracted many tourists and photographers despite the freezing temperature. In Brazil, a drive through Christmas lights display has brightened up the holiday season ravaged by the coronavirus this year. Details in this report. All may not be calm in 2020, but some things are still bright this Christmas in Brazil. In the city of Sao Paulo, the Lumina Festival is bringing the spark of the season to locals who were otherwise stuck at home during the pandemic. Organizers install elaborate Christmas decorations and glittering lights that can be viewed from the safety of a private car. The idea was to have a moment of joy, a moment when people can safely leave their homes to feel safe and enjoy moments within a family with the love, peace and hope that Christmas gives, even if it is just for an hour or 40 minutes. For those passing by for a glimpse of Christmas from their cars, the results are delightful but also bittersweet. This is a great event. People were at home thinking about what they can do and to have an event like this where you're safe to not get out of the car is great millions of brazilians are preparing for a very different christmas this year with many cities also cancelling traditional new year's eve fireworks festivities Football Chelsea came from one goal behind to beat Leeds United 3-1 in the English Premier League. With the swing, Chelsea have moved to the top of the table. Former Blues striker Patrick Bamford gained Leeds an early lead at the Stamford Bridge. Olivier Giroud then equalised for Chelsea in the first half, scoring his fifth goal of the week for the Blues. Kurt Zuma and Christian Pulisic scored second-half goals for Chelsea to make the scoreline 3-1 at the final whistle. 
In another fixture, Manchester City beat Fulham 2-0 at home. Raheem Sterling and Kevin De Bruyne scored goals for the City. In the Spanish La Liga, Sadis beat Barcelona 2-1 at the Estadio Ramon de Carranza Stadium. This is their first La Liga win against Barcelona since 1991. Alvaro Jimenez put Cardiz in front before an own goal from Pedro Alcala brought Barca in the second half. Former Manchester City striker Alvaro Negredo then took advantage of the symbolic defending to score the winner. In another fixture, Atletico Madrid beat Valladolid 2-0 at Vanda Metropolitano Stadium. Thomas Lemar and Marcos Llorente scored goals for the home side. Real Madrid also won their away fixture 1-0 against Sevilla. Now in the Italian Serie A, Inter Milan beat Bologna 3-1 at San Siro. Ashraf Hakimi scored a brace for Inter as they go second on the Serie A table. Romelu Lukaku considered his fine goal scoring season, netting the opener in the 16th minute of the match. Ashraf Hakimi lashed on the Marcelo Brozovic's ball forward to double Inter's lead. Emmanuel Vignato briefly gave Bologna hope, but Hakim's fine sole goal sealed the win for Antonio Conte's team. In another fixture, Juventus beat Torino 2-1 at home. And now let's have a look at the weather updates. That is all for now. For the latest updates, you can follow us on social media at Indus.news. Take care.